Hello and welcome. Today we want to celebrate the goodness of God. Psalm 118 says simply, Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. And that's what we're celebrating today. And it's what we call worship. When we simply acknowledge how great God is and that we are not worthy of his presence. And yet he calls us. He calls us in to be close to him and he showers us with blessings. He provides for us, he cares for us and he is faithful. We celebrate that in our first song, Great is Thy Faithfulness. He is faithful. Let's pray. Glorious God, we worship you in your holiness, in the wonder of your presence. We acknowledge that you are perfect and all your ways are right and good. Generous God, we thank you for the ways in which you pour out your blessings upon us 
and share with us your great provision. You are faithful, Lord. You have given us and cared for us in the past and you will do so again in the future. You have promised that whenever we put you and your kingdom first, then you will provide. We praise you, generous, generous God. Gracious God, we thank you for the ways in which you have poured out your mercy and your love upon us. We thank you that in Jesus we can receive forgiveness we can be made new. You are gracious to us. When we do not deserve your mercy, you pour it out. Your love endures forever. Gentle God, deal with us carefully, for you know that we are weak and fragile and we need your strength we need your guidance and so today O oh Lord as we consider your word and as we come to grow closer to you draw us gently with your cords of love that cannot be broken draw us closer to yourself Amen. It is wonderful, isn't it? Knowing that we're in the hands of the Almighty God, the God who is good and gracious, the God who cares for us. And he is the God who is generous, who pours out his blessings upon us. There's a wonderful chapter that the prophet Isaiah wrote as he calls on the people to come and receive the blessings of God. You don't have to work for them, he says. You don't have to try and earn them. His blessings are poured out freely. Come, he says, receive. Listen to the beautiful way he puts it. Come. All you who are thirsty, come to the waters, and you who have no money, come buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Why spend money on what is not bread, and your labour on what does not satisfy? Listen. Listen to me and eat what is good, and your soul will delight in the richest of fare. Give ear and come to me, hear me, that your soul may live. I will make an everlasting covenant with you, my faithful love promised to David. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the evil man his thoughts. Let him turn to the Lord and he will have mercy on him and to our God for he will freely pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. As the rain and the snow come down from heaven, and do not return to it without watering the earth, and making it bud and flourish, so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater. So is my word that goes out from my mouth. 
it will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. You will go out in joy and be led forth in peace. The mountains and hills will burst into song before you, and all the trees of the field will clap their hands. Instead of the thorn bush will grow the pine tree, and instead of briars the myrtle will grow. This will be for the Lord's renown, for an everlasting sign which will not be destroyed. Isn't that a lovely passage? Come, says God. Just come and take what you need. Here it is. All that I have to offer you. And it finishes up with that picture of joy. You'll be led out with joy. You'll be led forth in peace. The mountains and hills will burst into song before you. As if all creation wants to celebrate when we find the blessing of God flowing into our lives. And it will all be for God's renown, as he puts it, for the Lord's renown, in order to praise God. This is a picture of God's unconditional love. The unconditional love that God has for us inspires us to love others unconditionally too. And it's that unconditional giving love that comes from God that has inspired the leprosy mission. Now we have a tradition in our church of, of keeping up with the leprosy mission because of our, our link to it through David Burgess. And around this time of the year, we normally have a Sunday when we concentrate on the leprosy mission. So I've got a little video for you here, and it's all about this, this year's appeal, which they have called the unconditional appeal. Because they send out the message to those who are suffering from leprosy in this world today. Look, it doesn't matter where you're from, whether you can support yourself or not, it, it doesn't matter what it is. Unconditionally, come and receive treatment. You are welcome. And that unconditional welcome is something that's so precious to people who are suffering from leprosy. Because so many others in the community want to push them away as they are afraid of the disease. Listen to the video. It'll speak for itself. Hello, I'm Darcy Bustle, and I'm proud to be supporting the Leprosy Mission's Unconditional Appeal. I first met people living with leprosy three years ago whilst on a trip with my family in Mozambique. It was shocking to discover so many cases of leprosy hidden away in remote rural areas. But I was struck by the love, grit and determination of those working to find and treat people affected by it. People like Zaina. She knows from personal experience just how devastating leprosy can be. Zaina was a young mother when she first noticed discolored patches on her skin. She didn't know what they were, but when neighbors recognized the signs of leprosy, they banished her to the forest and took away her three-year-old son. Thanks to the unconditional efforts of leprosy mission staff, Zaina was found, treated and cured. Today, she is a leader of her community, helping to find and welcome home other people affected by leprosy. Anyone who needs help comes to me. 
And the people who once banished me now come and participate in our meetings. We are changing people's attitudes. I am so happy. I wish I could take my heart out and show everyone how happy it is. Zaina is just one member of a large community of leprosy changemakers, made up of health workers, public speakers and volunteers, all determined to make leprosy a thing of the past. And you can join them and become a leprosy changemaker too, by giving a gift to set this all in motion. When you become a leprosy changemaker, you'll help find people affected by the disease, no matter where they are, and get them the urgent medical treatment they need. In the far north of Mozambique, Gabriel, a health worker trained by the leprosy mission, has been on the road for three hours. He's heard from local villagers about a young woman who is showing early signs of leprosy. If he finds someone with symptoms, he undertakes a thorough assessment, checking for patches, loss of feeling, and inflamed nerves. People often worry about what will happen to them if leprosy is confirmed. So Gabriel is ready to offer help and advice. Often, when a patient first receives the diagnosis, they feel frightened, dejected, and need supporting. We have to prepare them because the treatment is long. We also talk to the community. We invite them to a place, a community hub, where we give lectures about leprosy and stigma to reassure people. The Leprosy Mission is helping communities to build hubs across Mozambique. These are places of hope where people affected by leprosy are welcomed unconditionally. A place where they can meet without fear of stigma or rejection and receive the care and treatment they need. But a hub is much more than a place where leprosy is cured. It is the beating heart of village life. A safe space where everyone is welcome where health camps are held and where communities learn about leprosy through song, dance and drama. Please, will you help build more community hubs by giving a gift to the Unconditional Appeal? And if you give before the 24th of April, your donation will be doubled by the UK government at no extra cost to you, meaning your gift will change twice as many people's lives. Please join our community of leprosy changemakers and help make this ancient disease a thing of the past in Mozambique. Together with your help, we will stop at nothing to prevent leprosy and end the disability and prejudice it causes. That is unconditional. Thank you. 24 pounds, double to 48 pounds, finds and cures two people of leprosy. 70 pounds, doubled to 140 pounds, trains two leprosy change makers. 161 pounds, doubled to 322 pounds, pays for a community health camp. Isn't it wonderful to see that joy on their faces after they've been healed and received back into the community again? This is what the love of God inspires. This sort of unconditional welcome, this, the way that lives are transformed by the love that is shown. Because our God is the God who takes our negatives and turns them into positives. He takes our broken hearts and he mends them. He takes our grief and he gives us his joy. He takes our fear and he gives us peace. This is the work of God and it's all for his glory. 
If you want to give to the Work of Leprosy mission, then please do Google Unconditional Appeal and that will get you quite easily through to the place where you can donate online. If you're not able to donate online, then you can give through the church. It's not quite so easy for us in these days, but we'll deal with it. We'll get it passed on to the missionary leprosy mission, if that's what you would like. I don't want to badger you for money. That wasn't the purpose of showing that film, although I know some of you would like to give. Mostly it was just to bring you up to date to keep you in touch with what the leprosy mission is doing at the moment. I know there are lots of calls on your money at this time and there are, it's a difficult time, but if you can give, it will be doubled by the government. So that's great because it's a good thing to give to. The leprosy mission is great. That's part that's one of the aspects of God's love in action in the world. It's a mission that's full of hope and joy. And that's the theme of our next song too. Lord of all hopefulness. As it takes us through the day, bringing us into hopefulness and love and peace and joy. Stu will lead us in prayer after that. Lord, thank you for your unfailing love. And we turn to you now in prayer in these troubled times. Lord, we pray for our government. Lord, grant them wisdom and guide them to make the right decisions in these troubled times. Lord, we pray for the new American president, 
we pray that he also will be granted wisdom. And Lord, that you will bring priests back into America, that they may all work together in unity. We pray for those who are fighting the COVID virus at this time, that you will grant them wisdom and courage to deal with the situations that they must go into. We pray for the sick and those who are caring for them. Lord, we pray for healing. We pray for protection. We pray that you will bring peace. Lord, we pray for those who are bereaved. At this time, who have lost loved ones. We pray, Lord, that you will bring them peace. And that you will wrap your arms of comfort around them. We pray for the isolated and the lonely in these difficult times where people cannot meet and they cannot support each other. Lord, we pray that you will bring hope and you will bring peace in these times. Lord, we pray for our church leaders. We pray for Liz and Barbara and the deacons. And at this time, Lord, that you will be with them, that you will be a light to their feet and guide them, that they may step forward into these uncertain times with you with them. We thank that you are always with us. You are our rock, our fortress and our salvation. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed. For his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. I say to myself, the Lord is my portion. Therefore, I will wait for him. The Lord is good to those who hope is in him. To the ones who seek him, it is good to wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. Amen. Thank you, Stu. God is great. He is our rock, our fortress and our salvation. His compassions never fail. They are new every morning. That's something that the person at the centre of our reading for today started to discover when she met Jesus. We're in John's Gospel and Chapter 4 today with a woman who didn't really know what she needed, although she knew she needed something. And she didn't really know what she wanted, although she knew she wanted something. I'll pass you over to Barbara and Paul as they explain what happened one day when Jesus took a rest by a well in Samaria and met up with a woman. Now you have to realise before we start to listen to the reading that in those days the Jews looked down very much at the Samaritans. They regarded them as not proper Jews. They had intermarried over the, over the generations and uh, they, had, they did not worship in quite the same way as the Jews further south. There was an ongoing conflict between them also as to where the temple of, of God should be. Should it be in Jerusalem or should it be on a mountain in Samaria? There was biblical evidence to support either one. And so they squabbled and they looked down on each other. And in addition, men did not talk directly with women without there being others around to supervise. All in all, this was an unusual conversation. Would you draw water and give me a drink? I can't believe that you, a Jew, would associate with me, a Samaritan woman, much less ask me to give you a drink. You don't know the gift of God, or who's asking you for a drink of this water from Jacob's well, because if you did, you would have asked him for something greater and he would have given you the living water. Uh, you sit by this deep well. A thirsty man without a bucket in sight. 
Where does this living water come from? Are you claiming superiority to our father Jacob, who laboured long and hard to dig and maintain this well so that he could share clean water with his sons and grandchildren and cattle? Drink this water and your thirst is quenched for a moment. You must return to this well again and again. I offer water that will become a wellspring within you that gives life throughout eternity. You'll never be thirsty again. Please, sir, give me some of this water so I'll never be thirsty and never again have to make the trip to this well. Then bring your husband to me. I do not have a husband. Technically, you're telling the truth. But you've had five husbands and you're currently living with a man who you're not married to. Sir, it is obvious to me that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped here on this mountain, but your people say that Jerusalem is the only place for all to worship. Which is it? Woman, I tell you that neither is so. Believe this, a new day is coming. In fact, it's already here when the importance will not be placed on the time and the place of worship, but on truthful hearts of worshippers. You worship what you don't know. Well, we worship what we do know because God's salvation is coming through the Jews. The Father is spirit and he's seeking followers whose worship is sourced in truth and deeply spiritual as well. Regardless of whether you're in Jerusalem or on this mountain, if you do not seek the Father, then you do not worship. These mysteries will be made clear by he who has promised the anointed one. The anointed one is speaking to you. I am the one you've been looking for. I met a stranger who knew everything about me. Come and see for yourselves. Can he be the anointed one? What a wonderful insight we have there into one person's meeting with Jesus and how it changed her life. Jesus is there at the middle of the day. What's happened is that he and his disciples have been uh, traveling up through Samaria. They've been walking all morning. It's the middle of the day. They're tired, they're hungry, and so Jesus says, I'm going to just sit here and take a rest. You go to the shops and get something for lunch and meet me back here. While Jesus is sitting there by the well, a woman comes to get water. Now, it's not a normal time for a woman to come and draw water. They would normally do it right at the beginning of the day or indeed at the end of the day when it's cooler. That's when all the women would gather together. There would be a, a bit of a, a chatty, sociable time, as well as the work of drawing water. So why was this woman coming in the middle of the day, when it was hot, when most people were inside their homes, sheltering from the sun? Jesus could see quite quickly that here was a woman who liked to keep herself away from others, who would tease her and reject her. She was not regarded as a respectable woman to be seen with. And the Holy Spirit spoke to Jesus' heart and told him some truths about her that she had indeed been married five times and now was in another relationship altogether. Here was a woman who was in need. She didn't know what she needed, but she knew she needed something. She couldn't bear to be alone, but it didn't work out when she was with someone either. She went from one relationship to another. She knew she wanted something 
but she didn't know quite what it was she wanted. And she met Jesus. I love all the times that God arranges it so that we have those moments of meeting, those God moments, when thing, people just come together. He arranges them, of course. Jesus knew when he sat down by that well that he would meet someone who really needed him. So he started the conversation in the most gracious way. He asked her for help. Would you give me a water, a drink of water? It sounds like a normal request, doesn't it? Something that you'd just ask a stranger in that context. But this woman knew that that was not normal. Jesus, clearly by his mode of dress, was a Jew. In fact, she could probably see that he was a Jewish rabbi, a teacher. And he was a man. She was everything else. She was not a pure Jew. She was not a man. She was not a respectable person. And she said, are you sure? You want to receive a drink of water from me? Most Jews wouldn't even contemplate receiving something like that from someone like her. So right from the time he first opens his mouth, Jesus is there showing that he cares, he loves, he welcomes, he accepts. He does the same with us. Other people may reject us, other people may put us down, but Jesus does not. He welcomes us, he accepts us, he goes further, he loves us. And Jesus carefully developed the conversation. They started talking about water. That's the conversation opener. And so Jesus uses that to explain how that this thing that this woman needs so much that she has to come every day at an inconvenient moment to get it. She has to risk the scorn of whoever she might meet on the way because she needs water. And in the same way, Jesus was explaining, look, there is something else that you really need. It's a matter of life and death for you, but you don't know it yet. And he described it as being like living water, water of life. She said, give it to me. If you really can provide water so that I don't have to come here and, and draw from the well anymore. And he said, no, it's not that sort of water that I'm talking about. And then he used that as an excuse to talk about her, her situation in life and mentions her multiple relationships. And she starts to open up. And she realises that he is someone special. There's a natural reaction then that happens, a defensive reaction. Let's change the subject because I don't want him getting too close. If he knew to what, what I know about me, then he wouldn't like me anymore, is her thinking. So let's change the subject to something safe. He's clearly a prophet, a teacher, someone special, someone that God speaks to. So let's talk about religious things. Do you know this has happened to me so many times? I start to talk to someone and we start to touch on a sensitive subject. And because they know that they're talking to a church minister, 
they deflect the attention away from themselves by talking about something religious. They would talk about church buildings that they've visited or, or something like that. This woman did the same. Deflect the conversation. Let's have a theological discussion. The big discussion that is ongoing between the Jews and the Samaritans at that time is where should they go to worship? The Samaritans like to go to Mount Harrison. The Jews like to go to the Temple of Jerusalem. Both could build up a, a, a discussion, a set of reasons for why they should do what they do. And Jesus pushes that aside. He doesn't get into it because for him it's irrelevant where you worship. What is relevant for him is how we worship. God is a spiritual being, he says. And the time is coming when what is important is that those who really want to know God should worship him in a way that is truthful, honest, sincere and deeply spiritual. Regardless of where you are, he says, if you don't seek the Father, then you do not worship. Come to him in genuine need of knowing him. Seek him at the deepest level and you will find him. Isn't that a wonderful promise? It's a promise that actually is repeated through scriptures. Seek me and you will find me, says the Lord through the prophets. Seek and you will find, says Jesus. Open your heart and say, Lord, come in. And he will. And that's the heart of it. That's what this woman needed. Because that's what each one of us needs. There have been those right down through the, the, the pages of, of history who have reached out to God and found in him the answer. Even the great names of Christianity have done so. I think of Augustine. We often call him Saint Augustine. He was a leader of the church in North Africa uh, in the early centuries of the church. And he described how he discovered God when he read the scriptures. He put it like this. How sweet all at once it was for me to be rid of those fruitless joys which I had once feared to lose. You drove them from me, he says to God. You who are the true, the sovereign joy. You drove them from me and took their place, O oh Lord, my God, my light, my wealth and my salvation. Augustine, as a young man, had tried all the, the pleasures of this world. He'd been rather like this woman, going from one relationship to another, forever seeking that closeness, that intimacy, that need for love, unconditional love, and not knowing where to find it until he found God. Or think of Martin Luther. And he had sought God for quite a while. He'd even gone to the extent of becoming a monk. And that didn't satisfy either. And as he was reading the scriptures one day, he came across the phrase, the righteousness of God. 
and he felt I can never fulfill that level of righteousness. Surely I can never be accepted by God. And he knew this great disappointment, this great sorrow within him because he could never be level to God. And then he realized that what he was reading was not just the righteousness of God, but that the righteousness of God received through faith. He was reading Paul's writings in the New Testament. And he realized that the righteousness of God is revealed by the gospel and received by faith. He wrote this, the righteousness with which the merciful God justifies us by faith as it is written, he who through faith is righteous shall live. And here I felt that I was altogether born again and had entered paradise itself through open gates. Yes, yet another person who simply accepted the gift of God and realised that that is the answer to his seeking. I think of John Bunyan, another one of those greats in the history of the church. He suffered imprisonment for years because if he preached the gospel of God in the open, that was illegal. And he would not agree to stop preaching. And so they imprisoned him. He was in prison in Bedford Jail for some years. Looking back over the time when he realised the goodness of God, he, he described one day when he was walking. He, was, he said he was walking through a field. It was quite an ordinary day, but as he was walking, he was thinking about what he had been reading. He'd been reading from the Bible. And he was reading about God's righteousness and that God's righteousness is held for him in heaven. And as he was thinking about this, as he was walking through the field, then the truth of it sort of dropped into his heart, into his gut, and he realised it, accepted it. Yes, he was held by God. He was made righteous by God. And he says this, Now did my chains fall off my legs indeed. I was loosed from my afflictions and irons, my temptations also fled away, so that from that time those dreadful scriptures about sin and, and so forth left off to trouble me. Now went I also home rejoicing for the grace and love of God. While John Bunyan was in jail, he wrote about the Christian life in terms of an allegory. He called it The Pilgrim's Progress. It's a book that has been in print ever since. It has sold more copies than any other book in the world, except for the, God, for the Bible itself. It describes the progress of a Christian person or someone becoming a Christian. And there is a point in that where this man that he calls Christian, this pilgrim, comes to the foot of a cross and he realised that Jesus died for him there. And as he bows down at the cross, the burden, the, the big heavy burden that he's carrying on his back comes away and falls off and rolls down the hill. And in that picture, Bunyan tries to describe in, in the picture what it felt like for him when he realised too that he was held by the love of God and 
All he had to do was put his faith in him and receive the righteousness of God, the forgiveness for his sins, the freedom that God was offering. These people have in common the, the woman that Jesus met. Augustine, Martin Luther, John Bunyan, they all have in common this great experience of joy as they receive from God the gift, the free gift of his mercy, his love, his blessing. It's the same as what's written in Isaiah where he talks about come and receive the water of life. Come, receive the bread of life. Come, come to God and receive, and you will go forth in joy. Do you know what it is that you need? You may express it differently, but doesn't it feel to you something like a deep thirst and the ordinary water of life doesn't satisfy? Doesn't it feel like a, a desire to be loved just unconditionally? Doesn't it feel to you like a lack of peace, a lack of joy and you don't know what will release that peace in your heart. The answer is Jesus. Like Jesus said to the woman at the well, I'm the one you've been looking for. And then that woman went out and she met the others in the town those others that she'd so often been trying to avoid. She sought them out and she said, I met a stranger who knew everything about me. Come and see for yourselves. Can he be the anointed one? Is he the one? For me, I have to say, yes, he is. He's the one. He's the one who heals my brokenness. Heals, he's the one who takes my sorrow and gives me joy. He's the one who takes my sin and gives me righteousness. He's the one who takes my emptiness and gives me full, fullness of life. And all the other blessings of this life flow from that. I don't have to reject this life. He makes everything richer because it's built on him. Come to Jesus. Come and accept what he has to offer. Like Jesus says, just come to him truthfully, honestly, openly offering who you are and saying, come to me. Come right down deep to my spirit. Come. That's true worship when we open ourselves to him. Here's a song that takes us into the heart of worship. It's not about a pretty song. It's not about the right words. The heart of worship is about truth and honesty and openness and offering ourselves to God. In return, accepting all that he has to offer. Make this the start of your worship.
we come to the Lord in need and wanting from him the answer. We know that he is what we need. And then when we open our hearts to him, we realise that we want to give to him. Give to him our worship, our praise, our love. Because he is the one who is worthy. Let's pray. Lord, I simply come longing to bring something that's of worth that will bless your heart. Though I'm weak and poor, all I have is yours, every single breath. Lord, you are all I need. You are the one who can come right in and answer. Lord Jesus, you're the one that I've been looking for. We worship you now. We praise you. We give you the love of our hearts. Come in, Lord Jesus. Do your work. We praise you and we love you. Amen. It's been wonderful to be able to share with you today. Join us again next week. And if you want to get in touch, then there's a way to contact, make contact through the website, nsb.org.uk, and just go to the contact page. I'd love to hear from you. And if you want to know more about what it's like to receive Jesus as your saviour, to know him as the answer to your need, get in touch. And may God bless you all through this week. May you know his love pouring down and filling your life. May you know his faithfulness, his compassions, newer every morning. God bless you, now and every day. Amen.